Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I first saw the screen that's before you, I couldn't help be taken back a number of years to a church in Tennessee. We were trying to reach out to people who needed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we had a map of faces. And that map of faces had one person missing. That one person could be someone who you have seen in church in the past, but they're not there for some reason or another. They've wandered away from the faith. Or it could be someone who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But who in the world is going to reach out to people? Is it going to be pastors alone? Or it will be people like you and I who are soldiers who go out into the world and take our place because we are called to be in cross-cultural ministry. We are into that today, and I pray the Lord will bless us as we understand what he calls us to do. James writes, my dear brothers, as believers in our Lord, glorious Jesus Christ, do not show favoritism. I've just studied the Bible, uh, the book of James with a number of folks, and we found out, at least in the book of James, the word brothers is used 27 times. James is writing to believers, and he's saying to believers, don't show favoritism. When I think about this, I want to ask you a few questions that relate to your comfort zone. The first question is, what is a thermostat set at on your home? Uh, yeah, some of you are laughing. As we get older, we turn the thermostat up a little bit. Ours is set at 78 during the summer, and we can handle it. And people are waving in the back. In the winter, it's all by age, I'm telling you, okay? In the winter, we set our thermostat at 68, no lower than 68. But we set it at 68 at night because it's cooler. We put a comforter on our bed, and we save money. You can try it. We don't program our thermostat, but we know what our comfort level is. Matter of fact, I'm wearing a blanket today, and it's just a little warm, but it's okay. Where is your people thermostat set? Are you more likely to go into a room of five or 50? Five people you know or don't know? Or 50 people that you know or don't know? This morning, I've been to three services. So far, I've known directly when they reminded me that I knew two people. Fortunately, I've grown comfortable being with people I don't know. And after the service, I'll leave. But you all still have to deal with each other and the world around you where you come in contact with people every day. I pray that we'll be led, as my verse says ahead of us here, that cross-cultural ministry is ministry motivated by, motivated by the gospel of Christ in leading you to go out of your comfort zone into a ministry zone. You get the difference? It's uncomfortable with people who are not like you. Cross-cultural ministry begins at the cross. You'll notice in the next few slides that the word cross is there in many of the words. Jesus came across time and became one of us. St. Paul writes, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. I like to call this today Christmas in September. You realize when we speak the creeds, as you've done, you state the fact that Jesus Christ was born. He was a real person. He lived on this earth. And my own reasoning, based on my own background, I would say that many people would say today, if Jesus Christ had been born today in our society, it would be in vitro fertilization. It wouldn't be a concept where Mary was a virgin at all. But he came at the right time, at the fullness of time. So he might be able to speak without sin, speak without uh, the difficulty of others might have in understanding that he is the Son of God and our Savior. He came at the fullness of time. I thought about writing an article, and I probably will one day. It's going to be entitled, Don't Throw the Baby Out with a Baptismal Water. You see what happens in our church as well as other churches. Our babies are baptized. We get them confirmed, and they've graduated from church. Is that God's will for those children? And is it God's will for you? I pray that each one of us will pray for our children, our grandchildren, 
whoever it is we have not seen in church, who have been baptized, and need to understand what they've been taught and take that out in the world with them. Jesus crossed over to Samaria to share information about true worship. Many of you know this story. I like to tell these stories and put it up there on the screen because it reminds us of what God speaks in his word. Jesus went to Samaria where, they were, where Samaritans hated the Jews. And he's at a well in the middle of the heat of the day asking a woman to bring him some water. And he, she says, then why do you come to me and why do you want water from me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Jesus says, uh, go find your husband. She says, uh, I have no husband. She said, you're right. He said, you've had four husbands, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. Jesus spoke the plain truth, which we need to speak today. And that woman was so convinced about what Jesus said about true worship, she went back and told everyone else what he had done. How are you at telling everyone else what God's done for you? Do you know that we're really not likely to do that very easily? Many years ago, there was a survey put out about churches and how loving they were. You know where the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, came in? We are not in the Super Bowl. We came in 32nd out of all denominations. The challenge is, we know what God has to say. But as James puts it, faith needs to be followed by deeds. Even as weak as you are sometimes in your faith, God will use you. More about that later. Jesus crossed up the rituals and the regulations of his day. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus healed people on Sunday or Saturday, their Sabbath. And the people of the, of the church at that time were upset with them. They had so many rules. They had 622 rules to fulfill the Ten Commandments. How many of you can keep 622 rules? Uh, let me give you one. If you were a tailor, by the way, if you were a person who sewed clothes and you came to church today with a needle in your pocket, you broke the law. That's an unnecessary weight to carry. How many of you carried milk today over 100 feet? You might want to count those feet because if you did, you'd be breaking the Sabbath according to their rules. The Sabbath was made for you. One of the things I sense about the Sabbath, and I am as guilty as others are, we filled our Sunday with too many things. From one sport to the next sport. I'm not sure. I do watch television. Not in black and white. I do have color. In case you're worried about my age and what I might not know. I know how to use a smartphone even though I'm not that smart. But I do too much time with any one of those implements takes us away from time just to think. We need to think. We need to stop and say, Lord, what do you want to do in my life with me? Take time on the Sabbath. I worked as a registered nurse for about 14 years. I didn't have the Sabbath off. Quite often I worked on the weekend. And some of our nurses do today, and doctors as well. Pray for those people. Pray for them, especially those that work with COVID, that they get rest. Because they need it desperate. There's a lot more we can pray about. Hopefully in the sermon you'll come up with a few other things that might be helpful to you. The Sabbath was intended for us for spiritual, mental, and physical restoration. Jesus' true glory is seen in the cross of Calvary. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I don't know if you know this or not, but one of your family members here at, at uh, where am I today? Across the, no, where am I? Cedar Hill, thank you. I knew I was somewhere. I'm 76 years old. Give me a break, okay? But do you know that one of your members has a tattoo on his arm, and it's telestai, to telestai, which means it is finished? Three little words. After Jesus went through all the suffering he could, and even more, he said those words to tell us that the work he had to do was finished. He died on the cross and rose again. I still remember a professor saying this before I left the seminary. 
don't leave Jesus in the grave. Too many times we talk about Jesus' death, but we don't concentrate on the resurrection. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He lives. Jesus Christ returned across time and sits at the right hand of God. Jesus ascended into heaven. When he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Have you ever thought about what Jesus is doing now? Right now. You know, he's going to come back someday. I share this in the first service and second service. Maybe I'll share it again. You know, at the time of the flood, how many people were saved? Eight people. It was so bad in the world that God destroyed all the living creatures except those in the ark and all the people except for eight, one family. I asked myself the other day, how bad will it be when Christ comes back? How many people will still be here that are believers? Will you continue to believe? I pray you do. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us that we will be faithful until he returns. You know these words. Some of you have these in your confirmation verse. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. God calls us to be faithful. Jesus, by the way, if you're interested, is interceding for us. Can you imagine that? Jesus praying for us right now? Praying that we would remain faithful? Praying that we would see that he has a purpose for us in this world until he calls us home? We must admit at times that we create earthly barriers to cross-cultural ministry. James says this, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. At times, we consider others around us a royal pain instead of a royal opportunity. Wouldn't you agree with me, perhaps? I'll give you a couple of examples. You think of your own. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear them, but I'll think of mine as well. One of my, favorite, one of my royal pains is how people treat each other who do or do not wear a mask. I live in Jefferson County. We are one of the worst counties that relate to COVID. I'm just telling you that. My wife and I have had our injections. We've been vaccinated. We're waiting for the booster. It'll be coming. But I go into stores like I did this morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. I didn't wear my mask this morning because there was no one else there. But normally I put my mask on. I don't have to, but you know why I do? To let other people know it's okay. Do you know that the devil is trying to use something like COVID to separate people within the church? And how you treat each other? Yeah. You can say an amen if you wanted to, but you don't have to. Thank you. Now you're going to hear about my second royal pain. Remember, you all have yours. Keep them to yourselves. I don't like the way people are driving today. I took my grandson, who's 16 years old, out for a driving excursion. Three hours in a car with a 16-year-old. He survived. <laughs> we were out in the highway, a two-lane highway, and someone passed us with a double yellow line on a curve. I shared with my grandson, in probably not the best terms at all, that I did not particularly care for that. Now, my grandson has a heart of gold. He says, well, Grandpa, maybe they were late. And my response is, maybe they need to leave earlier. <laughs> we have gotten away from following the law as it relates to being safe with one another. Everybody, believe me, I believe this, and I hope you do too. Everybody now has their own rules about everything. But God has his rules, and the rules we have of the road were for our safety. I'll admit, when I'm on an interstate driving highway, sometimes I've gone over the speed limit just to stay alive. But that's not my choice, and I pray it's not yours either. Think about someone you might know who is a royal pain, and then ask yourself, would you want them to have an accident? Would you want them to develop cancer? Someone who's a royal pain to you, would you want them to go to hell? I can't think of any one person in my whole life I've ever met that I really wanted them to go to hell. I have on my prayer list people who I'm concerned about who I do not like. But people, it's coming. 
And unless we reach out to people of a different culture, the unchurched culture, the sinful culture, they may not ever see heaven. Are you willing to suffer a little with these insufferable people in order that Christ might be shown to them? I hope so. A number of years ago, I took my car to a, a, a gas station to get it filled, and I kept going there to get work done. And I met a man who tried to tell me jokes that I could never tell any of you, ever. And I told him, I'm a pastor. I really don't care to hear those anymore. Every time I went, he kept telling me jokes that I didn't want to hear. Have you heard this one, preacher? And so finally I said to him, I'll think, I, don't, I won't tell you what his name was. I'll try somebody else's name. I hope it's not here. I know he's not here. Uh, George, I'll call him George. George, what do you think hell's going to be like? What? If you continue down that road, that's where you're headed. I wouldn't start there. But sometimes we have to speak the truth in love. What you're doing is against God's will for you. And then tell them what God's will is in a nice, kind way. At times, it's too easy to show favoritism. First of all, to the wealthy. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. James says, sometimes we treat wealthy others better than others because of what they can do for us. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We're all tempted to do it, aren't we? Speaking through the Holy Spirit, James says, no. Think about the possibility of someone marrying someone because of his or her money or anything else. I grew up in a family of six children, uh, four brothers and a sister, and my mom, I, I think she said this, maybe, I'm, maybe it's not true, I think she said this to me, Jim, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich girl as it is a poor one. You know what? I didn't fall in love with a rich woman. I fell in love with a rich woman who knew God. Rich in her faith, not in her wealth. So if you have someone who's really close to you today, who loves you, how wealthy are you? You have the true wealth that will last forever. At times we find it too easy to show favoritism to those most like us. Uh, I like to use this illustration. Some of us, don't shoot the messenger, some of us, if we're Democrat, will only hang out with Democrats. Some of us who are Republicans will only hang out with Republicans. Some of us who are third service people will only hang out with third service people. Name your poison. I like this. Someone said this once. If both of us always agree, there might not be a need for one of us. Yeah, try that out in your marriage. Because if you agree on everything, something's wrong. I like this. A pastor wrote this in his newsletter last month. I thought it was great. He's talking about people getting along in the church. He said this. At times, the church as an organization, not as God would have it, is like Noah's Ark. The stench on the inside would be unbearable if it weren't for the storm outside. The day when you come to the Lord's Supper, the day when we receive Christ's body and blood, you are all alike. Right? Including me. We are all sinners in need of forgiveness. And when we truly believe Christ comes to us, guess what happens? Our sins are taken away. As far as the east is from the west. Every time. Do you know anybody else that would forgive you like that? I don't. When we come to that conclusion where there's a problem in how we speak to one another, St. Paul tells us in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all on the same side of the cross. Christians rejoice in show and tell ministry. When I lived in Tennessee, I lived about a mile from the closest convenience store, and I'm known to go get my coffee in the morning. I walked down there instead of uh, riding a bike or driving, and when I would go down there, I would look to see what was on the road. Do you know you can find things of value anytime you walk anywhere? 
I, I have more bungee cords in my garage than you can imagine. They were found along the road. I found, I found nuts and bolts. I've even found money. No matter where you go, you can find some value. My encouragement to you is, no matter where you go, there is someone of value to God in your path every day. Don't miss it. Linsky, who was a commentator, wrote about this passage from James. True gospel works are the native and necessary products of faith. When we do things because we are Christians, it shouldn't be foreign to us. It becomes more and more natural the more we seek to be more like Christ. Luther said, we are all to be little Christ to one another. And it's necessary. There is a response to faith. We call it the life of sanctification. I've had the privilege the last two weeks of watching Pastor David preach here by video. I thought it was great, by the way. And I thought about, I could change the, one of his words that he used in the sermon from last week. I think he said, start over or something like that. Well, in golf, we call that a mulligan. You get another chance. Or a dover, a do-over. Every day is a do-over, isn't it? For us, as we wake and arise and know that God goes with us, it's a do-over. How many people do you know that don't know Christ or don't have a relationship with him or are missing in church? You know, this the survey a number of years ago said that each layperson, that's you, all you soldiers out there, you know seven people. Ask Pastor David how many he knows. You know he has the guts to hang out with Christians? That's you. He doesn't know near as many people as you do. And you are the kind of people God wants to use to go into cross-cultural ministry. Because of Christ, then, we buckle up for cross-cultural ministry. I'd like for you to read these words for me. They're on the screen in front of you. They come from Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God. These are part of the spiritual attire we put on. So if you'd read that with me. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fit with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Uh, Jordan and I got in the car, and we got ready to start out on this trek. And I looked over at Jordan, and he's putting his seatbelt on. And this thought came to me. I'm hoping it's a God thought, but I thought I'd share it with you. I said, Jordan, you're getting ready to put your seatbelt on. Let's start with the shoulder strap. When you put the shoulder strap on, remember you are covered with Christ's righteousness. And then when you put the seatbelt on, you put on the belt of truth. Now, the Bible is actually 100% true. But there are some other truths we need to recognize. Laws of the land are laws given for our protection. I will tell you that I've been doing that every day now. Sometimes I slip up, but if I don't put my seatbelt on, i got this little bell that reminds me, bing, 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 bing. And then I put it on. But my attitude towards other people in the car has changed when I put on the pedal and I remember that I am to go out with the gospel of peace. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Ask the Lord to lead you to be ready to share the peace of God with others because you have peace that goes beyond all understanding. I think this is significant for us today. Do you know what happened after Jesus ascended into heaven? The disciples went back. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, Judea, and the end of the world. And if they hadn't done that, where would you be today? One Christian author wrote this, and I thought it was really great. What if the disciples went back and talked to the very people who crucified Christ? Can you imagine one of them going back to the guy who was standing at the base of the cross gambling for his clothes? Can you imagine the guy or whoever it was that built the crosses where they were crucified on? Can you imagine a carpenter? Can you imagine somebody who paves the highway? Can you imagine a police officer who was there when Jesus was arrested? If you are working anywhere, take your occupation. By the way, if you go back to the Bible, you'll find your occupation in some way. And there are people who need to know what you know. 
About two days ago, I think it was two or three days ago, I was, uh, I dream when I'm asleep. Sometimes they're not pleasant, sometimes they are. Two days ago or three days ago, I was sleeping, and I dreamt that I was going to a church to preach. Sound familiar? And uh, I got to church, and I couldn't find the sermon. Located anywhere. And I was anxious as you could possibly be. Scared to death that I might forget that sermon. And there were other pastors there. And one of them, came, this is a dream, by the way. One of them came up to me and said, Jim, rely on Christ. My encouragement to you, as you go out into the world and seek to be soldiers of the cross, rely on Christ. He'll lead you into the place where he wants you to be. He'll lead you to the people where he wants you to be. And then, as you get ready to go out, buckle up in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen.